Hey, and welcome to church. It is so good to have you here with us this afternoon. This week's going to look a little bit different to what you're used to. There's no worship, but we'd love you to sit down and just be involved in what God is saying to you through the sermon this afternoon. Mike is preaching on friendships, and I'm really excited for that. So buckle up, grab a book, grab a pen, um, and enjoy this message this afternoon. Well, hi there, church. I hope you had some fantastic worship today. Great coffee, as always. And a big hello if you're new here. My name's Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I'm not away on green team like a whole bunch of other people, but it's like green team is alive in me, or at least green things are alive in me. So you don't need me any closer than you have me right now. This is a good distance. You can trust me on that one. But I hope you get to catch you at church in the next few weeks. We're in the middle of this series, Love Ember. We do it every November. We dig in into relationships and what the Bible says about different aspects of them. And today, I want to talk about spiritual friendships. And spiritual friendships is not a wishy-washy thing. It's one of the most important things you can have in your life. And I can't wait to dig into that more. But what we love to talk about here at Encounter Church is that we are a church built on healthy relationships. We have a core value of people, and we dive into that by helping people have an encounter with God, not just in the supernatural sense, but in a present sense, an incarnational sense. And often the first time you have an encounter with Jesus might be someone you have met here today. So that's my prayer, that that, the meetings you have with someone else here today will be the beginning of an encounter with Jesus that will change your life. So I'm going to pray, and then what we'll do is we'll just jump straight into the message, okay? Why don't you pray with me? Holy Spirit, come. Would you bathe us with your presence today? Lord, would you invite us deeper? We pray that we would hear your voice clearly, that the things I say would be firmly from you, that they would be convicting to our hearts and transforming to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what I've noticed, and what might not be surprising to you at all, is that through COVID, people are lonelier than ever. Now, I actually talked about loneliness in the very first sermon I ever preached in Canada at our launch service. And to nobody's surprise, this has got worse during COVID, right? And in particular, it's got worse for the 18 to 24 demographic, which is a fair chunk of our church. 56% of young adults in Australia in 2021 are lonely. 56%, either some of the time or most of the time. That's quite a long chunk. That's not people who say rarely or never just people who say some or most of the time. Now, this is different from social isolation. Loneliness, social isolation are two different things. And of course, we have all felt isolated in the last couple of years. But if you've heard me talk about individualism, uh, then you might understand how that contributes to loneliness specifically. There are more one-person households. That contributes. There are more people working from home and in the gig economy. That contributes. Our continued shift to digital communication rather than in-person communication. I know I'm doing it right now, my apologies, um, but that contributes. And of course, COVID contributes by isolating us from one another. Now, I firmly believe that the church is the antidote to social isolation. And more than that, I believe today that this message, my challenge, my premise to you, is that spiritual friendships will lead you to the life you've always been looking for. The life you've always been looking for. So be prepared for that. But before we go down the spiritual friendship path, let me just sit on the church for a minute and just ask this question before I get into it properly. Let me challenge you. Are you committed? Are you connected to this church? And if not, why not? Now, if you're a visitor from another church, the same goes for your home church. But if you are not a visitor, ask yourself, why am I not committed? Why am I not deeply connected? Have you realized that this is not a place you go? If you're coming week after week and you're not serving, you're not in a life group, you are not deeply connected. These are things we do. They are vehicles to help you get connected because the church, the local church, is the cure to social isolation in our time. It's so important. And if you're hearing this on a podcast or watching it on YouTube later, I pray that you will take the plunge and join us at Encounter in person at some stage. It will be transformational. We've got a bunch of folk doing growth track right now. Why? They want to connect. They need that. They need that sense of connection. We've got a bunch of people doing life groups, doing life together throughout the city midweek. Why? Because they know they need it. They know they need the connection. They know they need the commitment. And we all need community. John Mark Comer puts it this way. We become like the relationships we cultivate and the culture to which we belong. 
We become like the relationships we cultivate and the culture to which we belong. Because when we develop spiritual friendships and become part of a church community, we are becoming more like Jesus. So if you want to hear more of that, just jump on our podcast, listen to the two messages from Encounter Camp. They'll be really helpful. But social isolation is not loneliness. Loneliness is now an epidemic of its own. It is running side by side with the COVID pandemic. And the biggest victim of this epidemic are young adults, and in particular, young men. Now, young men, and men in particular, just generally, have a historically awful job of developing deep friendships. Men, you'd be more mad at me, but you're too busy with your arms crossed trying to decide whether you trust me. That's half the problem. Now, we're always willing to have shallow conversations. Do you want to talk about sports or cars or jobs or home renovations? Absolutely. would love to talk about those things. But deep abiding friendships where conversations about serious matters can be explored not so much we're not so keen on those things now if you're married men you do get a little bit of that from marriage a separate study however showed that while marriage relationships are beneficial men still need their mates much more the research has found that male bonding is more likely to lower a man's stress levels than a night out with his partner or time spent with his family So married women listening, I just want to let you know, statistically, you cannot win. Sorry, it appears apparently you cannot win. Uh, But men desperately need to be married to you. But my pastoral experience, just shifting gears over to women for a minute, is this. You have many, many relationships, but few people who you call trusted friends. Many wide relationships, but few people to call on when it counts. I can't tell you how often women, particularly between the ages of 25 and 35, have spoken to Jan and to myself uh, and said they don't have a best friend. They might have a spouse, but they don't feel they have a, a close, trusted friend that can bear their burdens. So both men and women, you need to hear this. God has wired you to be known, to be known by others, fully known. One of the deep desires of the human heart is to know someone fully and to be fully known in return. And we can make the mistake of thinking this is just about marriage, and certainly that's a space where you want that to happen. But it's not the only place. If we, if you heard the single message from Kim Smith the other week, you'd know the depth of intimacy with God that singleness can bring, and spiritual friendship is for everyone. So let me read today's scripture. It's really simple, really powerful. One verse, it's going to be up on the screen, Proverbs 18.24, says this, One with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. One with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. Now, King Solomon wrote that, and I wonder whether he was thinking of his father, David's relationship with Jonathan, uh, one of the great platonic relationships in scriptures. There is a friend who stays closer than a brother. And when you hear that, I hope you know we are designed to have deep friendships. We have so many shallow connections instead. We have many followers, but few friends. That's the curse of the social media age. But shallow connections can cause problems. One with many friends may be harmed. Because maybe worst of all, amongst many other things we could talk about, a great volume of shallow connections can sometimes lead us to believe that this is all friendship can be. Just a very, very shallow pool. Like, is is that it? Just conversations about our partners and sports and hobbies and the kids like and our study? Is, is this all you've got? Is this the depth you have to you? You ever spoken to somebody and you're just looking at them going, is there, is there anything going on back there? Like, I feel like I can see myself reflected in their eyes. I feel like that when I listen to the footy commentator, Matthew Richardson. God bless him, handsome man. But I sometimes feel like I can see the clock inside his brain turning. And this is the sort of shallow conversation level we can get to at times. We ask ourselves, is this all we've got? Because this is not enough. And when we do this, we lack spiritual and relational depth as human beings. We run on empty and we have nowhere to turn when we need genuine help. But the Bible paints a different picture for us, friends. Proverbs is full of wisdom about the importance of deep friendships. The Gospels describe Jesus spending time and traveling with close companions. And the book of Acts shows how the early church was full of deep relationships, even complex ones like Paul and Barnabas. And I've already mentioned David and Jonathan. Now, these spiritual friendships are way more holistic than sexual relationships and are far more profound than surface-level Aussie mateship. It is not about hanging out. It's about building up. You are building something that matters. Let me say that again. You are building something that matters. 
the, these are friendships, spiritual friendships that are deep. They are mutual. They are life giving. They are godly relationships. These are the same as we are meant to have with God. Deep, mutual, life giving, godly relationships. They are vulnerable and open and profound. So let me say this again one more time, really clearly. Friendship is a more valuable thing to chase than romance. Friendship is much more valuable than romance. Its end goal can be achieved by anyone, with anyone, and it is deeper and longer lasting than a romantic attachment. Some of you are here, you're half convinced that the goal of this church is to set you up with a good husband or wife. And shouts to some of you, you have, you have achieved that. And maybe some of the folk up at Green Team, you're listening to this later, you just spend all weekend looking out of the corner of your eye at other young adults. Like it's just a, like a pool of young adults. You've been either at Ignite or Green Team this weekend going, yeah, okay, yeah, I like my chances. Green Team in particular, you're all wearing the same hoodie. No one's got a fashion advantage. You've got to love that. But let, like, just draw your eyes back here for a second. You need spiritual friendships way more than you need any of that. Spiritual friendships will be deeper, right? You, you, you've got to not live that unfulfilled life because it is unfulfilled. Your spouse will not fill the God-shaped hole in your life. No partner you ever have will. Truly great marriages are built on spiritual friendships first. Now, we are a church with the core value of being real. Amen? Right. Amen. Well, let me tell you this. A spiritual friendship is is where real goes from core value to clearly visible in your life. From core value to clearly visible. You actually live it out with another person. Now, how do they work? Glad you asked. Let me tell you. First of all, in spiritual friendships, there is invitation. Again, Proverbs 18.24, there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. When I say invitation, I mean someone inviting somebody deep into your life. Uh, barriers are being removed. Secrets are being revealed. Big problems are being shared. That's the depth of intimacy of knowing somebody. Now, because it's not a romantic relationship, different rules apply. You don't have to be monogamous. In fact, more friends can be better. Although, if you've got more than three deep spiritual friends, I'd probably question how deep you are really going in those relationships. See, Jesus, he had 12 disciples in particular that he was close to, but he had three that he was even closer with. They were his closest spiritual friends, Peter, James, and John. Now, we know that not only because they were named as that, but because of things like John describing himself as the beloved disciple of Peter, who was the first one to identify Jesus as the Christ. They saw things in Jesus and that relationship that was reciprocal of deep friendship. And Jesus brought them places the others didn't get to go. They went up the Mount of Transfiguration. There was an intimacy with Jesus. That's what spiritual friendship looks like. A deeper closeness with these people. Now, they're incredibly close relationally, but the beauty is there's a dynamic where you're not in that romantic relationship. And that's a good thing because it means there are lower expectations on one another, different expectations. So here's the thing. As you invite people deeper into your world relationally and you go further and further into invitation, it's like you're dropping coins into this spirit, in this relational piggy bank, right? Imagine a little piggy bank and you're putting coins in every time you spend time together and it grows interest over time. The longer you know each other, the more the trust builds. So that's like compound interest. So you keep putting these coins in and over time you build up this big deposit of friendship. So that is one part of spiritual friendship. It's like the investment. But there is a second important part. In spiritual friendships, there is challenge. Challenge. Proverbs 27, 6 says this, Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. If we don't have people in our lives, hear this church, who can tell us when we're living a life that doesn't reflect the will of God, then we will go on living a life that does not reflect the will of God. That doesn't just mean that you will live a life that's not what God wants you to live. You will live a life that is less fulfilling than you want it to be. That's why we need the element of challenge. We will be poor for it. We must have people to pull us up when it looks like we're falling into sin. But not even just sin. A true friend knows when to challenge you to push you further to grow in your relationship with Jesus. It's more than just the sin component. Now, as you challenge people more, it's the opposite with the piggy bank. That's like removing relational dollars from the bank. 
You are making a friendship withdrawal instead of a deposit. So this, this is the basic principle of the relational bank. If you don't make deposits, you can't make withdrawals. Okay? So if you are building a friendship, you're making deposit after deposit after deposit after deposit, guess what? You can make a withdrawal and say something tough. But if you try and say something tough without making a deposit, it's not going to work. Now, let me just map this out for you on the whiteboard. This is the beauty of printing from home. I've got my baby with me. Let me map it out on the whiteboard. If we map invitation and challenge out, it looks like this. We've got invitation up here and challenge over here. Now, if you have a friendship that is low intimacy and low challenge, then you don't have a friendship at all. It's dead. It is dead. It's not a friendship. There's nothing making you feel loved and there's nothing making you feel interested. There's no challenge and there's no intimacy. Now, most friendships are high invitation and low challenge. That's how they start. And these friendships are comfortable. Comfortable. Most of your friendships will be like this. In this quadrant, comfortable. They're like the Netflix of friendships. They're on demand without being demanding. Exactly what you always dreamed of, except they're a little bit pathetic. Like there's nothing wrong with them, but there's not that much right with them either. It's just you guys patting each other on the back, telling each other what, what good friends you are. And that's great, but it's not changing anything. A lot of our friendships look like this, but God wants more for your friendships. He wants you to build friendships that shake the gates of hell themselves, like Jesus and the disciples, like David and Jonathan, basically building an empire, like Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas planting across the Mediterranean. Everything can rest on amazing spiritual friendships if you let it. But it won't happen if your friendships remain comfortable. It just won't happen. God's vision for your friendships is spectacular. What he wants is in here. He wants a friendship with high invitation and high challenge. And this is a fully... Sorry for shaking the whiteboard. I'm getting excited here. I'm preaching, church. Fully alive friendship. Fully alive like the Irenaeus quote. Hebrews says this, verse 24 to 25, And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. That's the friendship part. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's encouragement and challenge, invitation and challenge, both at the same place. That's a relationship at its best, its most vitalized. That, my friends... That is the relationship you've always dreamed of. That's what you want. If you've ever walked away from a friendship just going, ah, oh, nothing's happening, it's because you need this element of challenge. And that brings me to this fourth section. This is a friendship that has high challenge but low invitation. It is a stressed friendship. A stressed friendship. It is low on trust but high on challenge. Now, this is what I was talking about before, taking too much money out of the relational bank. But if you want your comfortable friendship to become a fully alive friendship, it is unlikely to go straight across like that. You've got to take out deposits and challenge one another in order to get there, which means you have to risk the relationship becoming dead because people are afraid of challenge or stressed because there's too much challenge and not enough invitation in order for it to get fully alive. You're going to have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, this area right here, and risk the relationship in order to maximize a relationship. Now, I'm not telling you to do this with everybody. You have some people, they're surface level relationships, and that is okay. You do not need to push your local barista into the challenge zone. Just let them make their almond milk lattes in peace. But what you need to do with those close spiritual friends to get them into this place, a fully alive friendship that will challenge, that will grow you, is you've got to go through the valley of the shadow of death, take out relational deposits, and challenge one another to get there. Because in, in this kind of relationship, both truth and relationship are held in high regard, and they get pushed further, and that is the life you truly want. Somewhere where you are known and loved, and you are challenged and grown. That is when you are fully alive. And, 
And in this, that is true brotherhood, true sisterhood. It's the cure to social isolation, the cure to spiritual loneliness. It's the vehicle for mission. It's the basis of the church. It's the rawest expression of loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the life you've been longing for because the final point in spiritual friendships, there is Jesus. Now, friendships exist without Jesus, of course, even deep, life-giving ones. But for Christians, we must have Jesus. Jesus is the anchor our friendship is found in and the purpose our friendship is found for. It isn't just about getting by each day. It's about mission. It is about purpose. Your spiritual friendships are reminding you of the purpose of your love because Jesus is the one who taught us true spiritual friendship. I have a lot of conversations with lonely people, people longing for a deep friendship. And Ben, you can come back up. People who struggle in relationships with their family or struggle to find close friends. And the question they have is this, will there ever be anybody who sees me as I am and truly accepts me? Who knows me deeply and loves me unconditionally, not just the Instagram parts, the worst parts. And this may be a hard message for some people with those questions. Will I ever be fully known? Will anybody love me unconditionally? But somebody does. We have a friend who stays closer than a brother. One who has given us all of himself. One who fully knows us. Jesus extended the hand of friendship to us, church. Not because we were friends to him, but in fact, when we were still enemies to him. When we hurled stones and insults, he lifted up prayers. When we asked for his crucifixion, he asked for our forgiveness. But when we ask for reconciliation with God, he gives eternal life. All you need to know about friendship today can be seen through the actions of Jesus. The one who offers us eternal friendship, a friendship that connects us back to God the Father, the truest source of everything that is deep, the thing that will make you fully alive. John 15 puts it this way, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends because everything I've learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I choose you. Today, I want you to know that the words of Jesus to his disciples are words for you. They are words for you. He chooses you. Before the beginning of time, God saw you, knew you, chose you, and he extends the hand of friendship toward you. So the question today is, what are you going to do about God's hand of friendship? Is it time to say yes to Jesus? I want to pray for you, for those of you that need to know that hand of friendship, just right now. God, for all those people who need the hand of friendship and have never said yes to Jesus, Father, I just pray today is their day that they would know you have reached out before time to them, to be so present with them, to be friends with them, to call them your daughters and sons. Lord Jesus, would you help them welcome you home into their hearts so they can be fully alive today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, that's if that's you and you said yes to Jesus today, would you, would you just have a chat to our welcome team? We'd love to put a Bible in your hands as a way of saying congratulations and welcome to the family. But if you're here and you're already a Christian, maybe what you need to know is more about how to get your relationship fully alive. How do I make sure I have high invitation and high challenge in my relationship? I want you to go away and think about that because it is going to change your life If you let it happen, I do not say this lightly. The last 20 years of my life has been geared around this principle and it has changed my life. God bless you, church. I'm going to hand back to Pastor Jen now. Cannot wait to see you next week as Tim Littleford preaches up a storm on godly parenting. See you then.